Hello, I'm Dr. John Cavanaugh, and I'm back for AJS 101 Introduction to Criminal Justice, Lesson 3, Part 1. So let's begin. Let's talk about the nature of law. Now, laws are rules of conduct, and they, they forbid certain forms of behavior and mandate others. Now, for the most part, laws forbid behaviors. You can't steal, murder, you can't rob people, uh, you can't possess illegal drugs. Uh, the banning is the big part of law. But there are some laws that mandate behavior. The most obvious one is there's a law that requires you to file your income taxes. If you don't, you've broken the law and you can be penalized. Uh, there are also laws that require people that have special relationships to others to do certain acts. So if you're a parent, you are required to care for your children. And if you don't, you would be guilty of child neglect. Uh, so while most laws ban certain procedures, some laws also mandate them and there's penalties for breaking laws regardless of what type they are. Now, laws can come from lawmakers or from judges. Statutory law is written and codified by a government body, usually a legislature, which at the federal level is Congress, at the state level is the state legislature, uh, but at a local level it could be a town council. And these statutory laws are published in law books, so everybody can know about them, see them. And by codified, I mean they're organized. They're organized by subject matter. They have numbers, section, this, that, and the other thing. Okay. That's statutory law. Now, case law consists of the cumulative rulings by judges interpreting statutory law in many past cases. And these past cases where they interpret the law uh, are called precedents. So it's the job of the courts to interpret the law when the meaning is not clear. So somebody might challenge a law, say it's unconstitutional, or the courts might have to rule on the meaning of a certain word. Uh, well, when they do these things, uh, these if they're higher courts, these become legal precedents. And future courts are supposed to abide by those precedents. Certainly courts lower on the, the ranking scale than the court that rules on the precedent. Uh, now, of course, precedents can be overturned uh, by future courts, uh, although the longer a precedent stays in effect, the more uh, courts rule that that precedent is correct, the more the precedent becomes set in stone and less likely to be overturned. All right, let's look, about, let's look at the different types of laws. Now, the, Depending upon their purpose, their source, their application, laws can be divided into the following types. There is criminal law, there is civil law, there is administrative law, case law, and finally procedural law. Uh, for the most part, this course concerns itself with criminal law and procedural law. So let's move on. Now, criminal law which is also known as penal law, concerns itself with offenses committed against society, its members, their property, and the social order. In other words, criminal law consists of crimes against everyone, even though there may only be one victim. A basic concept of the criminal law, again, is that the criminal act not only harms the victim, but all of society. That's because if somebody's robbed, even though they're the one who suffers the loss and, and maybe gets injured, uh, we all feel less secure. We all feel worried about that kind of behavior occurring around us. Maybe we'll be next. So these more serious acts we consider to be uh, crimes and not just civil uh, violations that's uh, one person against another. Now, because crimes are acts against the state, state agents investigate the case. and. What do we call the state agents that investigate crimes? The police. And in addition, a state lawyer will press the charges in court. And what do we call that state lawyer? The prosecutor, uh, sometimes called district attorney, but it's the prosecutor. 
And they do this at no charge to the victim. And these cases are even titled the people of the state of Arizona versus John Criminal. So it's, it's everybody offended by this, even though there may be only one victim in some cases. So everybody is prosecuting. The state is against this person. Now, criminal law can be composed of statutory law and case law. We already described what those are. Statutory laws are the written codified laws that say what is illegal, what the penalties are, and it also mentions defenses and similar things. Case law, again, as we covered, are the past rulings of judges interpreting statutory law. Criminal law can also be substantive or procedural. Now, substantive criminal law is the part of the criminal law that defines what acts are illegal and what the penalties are for committing them. So, uh, rape, murder, uh, murder uh, arson, theft, right? These are the crimes, and in substantive criminal law, there'll be a description of what you precisely have to do in order to be found guilty of that. And then again, the penalty is also there. Now, we also have procedural criminal law, and this specifies the procedures of dealing with lawbreakers. And I'm talking about the procedures from the very earliest uh, involvement of the government, namely the investigatory stage by police, all the way to the final stage after conviction, if the person's guilty, or the punishment stage. All of the procedures and rules are in the procedural law book. For example, there are specific rules on when a police officer can stop, question, and frisk somebody. The officer has to have reasonable suspicion for the stop in question, has to have reasonable fear that the person is armed and dangerous for the frisk. Those, that's an example of a procedural criminal law. All right, let's move forward. Now, civil law concerns itself with private relationships between individuals. Contracts, torts, family relations, probate, labor law, consumer law, slander, these are all laws that deal with private relationships. You sign a contract uh, to perform a certain service for somebody and you don't perform that service. That's not a crime against all of society. But by the same token, society would like to see these disputes settled peaceably as opposed to the person who you uh, didn't do the service for coming after you and having to, to fight you to get you to do what you want to do. So we provide a court system where you can sue the person for violating the contract. Uh, other examples are fam family relations. When, when you want to get divorced, you have to go to family court. Uh, and that's where the divorce is decided upon and the terms are decided to go on. Probate deals with what happens to your property after you die if you don't have a will. Labor law deals with employees and employers and, and the different rights and responsibilities of each. Consumer law protects you against fraud, slander. You know, somebody can't uh, uh, say knowingly false things or recklessly false things against about you that, that harm your reputation. So these are all civil laws and you go to civil court to get them resolved and you have to pay for your own lawyer in civil court uh, as does the other person have to defend themselves with their own resources. Now the purposes of civil law is to compensate victims, right? That, that's one of the major things, uh, but also to uh, deter wrongful acts, uh, not to punish people. So civil law is primarily compensatory. Uh, you didn't fulfill the contract. The judgment would be that you have to do it or you have to give me my money back. Uh, you um, uh, were riding down the street in a bicycle and you crashed into my car and damaged it. Uh, you have to pay for the repairs, right? You're compensating the person for the harm done. And it also deters wrongful acts because people know they can be sued. Plus you can go to civil court if somebody is say, uh, continuously civilly wronging you, slandering you, and you can get uh, a restraining order or an injunction for them to stop the behavior. So civil law is compensatory, not really punitive. Now violations of civil law and other private wrongs other than contract violations are called torts. So any violation of civil law other than a contract violation is called a tort. And you'll hear people talk about tort law. A person alleging that he or she was civilly wronged 
is called a plaintiff. And plaintiffs bring lawsuits against defendants. Bringing the lawsuits means you're suing them. Uh, and if the plaintiff proves their case uh, by a preponderance of, an, of the evidence, and a preponderance of the evidence is 51%, they win and they can collect compensation damages. Now, awards can be compensatory, and again, as I said, they're intended to compensate the victim for the harm done. But in civil law, you can sometimes get punitive damages if you really, if the person really be behaved badly towards you. And they are uh, intended to punish the defendant for what they did, but this is not going to jail or prison, this is monetary. Uh, and it also deters future be bad behavior by the defendant. Uh, so that's the basic two types of awards in a civil case, compensatory to compensate, punitive to punish and deter future similar bad behavior. Now the civil courts are often swamped with cases, so sometimes you have to wait years to get your case fully heard. Uh, although if you go to small claims court on a minor thing, it, it's heard very quickly. Um, and some cases have very, very little merit and the plaintiff hopes to settle out of court for the case's nuisance value. And let me give you an example of this. Uh, as you know, I am a state legislator, and there is a law called the Americans with Disability Act. It's federal and state law, and it requires that uh, places that, that are public, like restaurants and stores, offices, that they have certain accommodations for handicapped people like uh, the toilet paper dispenser has to be at a certain height, uh, there has to be handicapped parking spaces, there has to be signs at a certain level saying the parking's restricted. There, there are many, many accommodation rules. Now, several years ago, and, and by the way, one of the interesting things about uh, the ADA, disabilities law, is that individuals can sue stores directly uh, for compensation and correction. So. Uh, several years ago, some rather disreputable lawyers began to uh, have several handicapped people who were working with them ride around and find really minor violations of the American with Disability Law Act. The toilet paper dispenser was, you know, two inches too far from the toilet. The sign on the parking space was, uh, you know, was eight inches too low. Very minor stuff. But they were violations of the disability law. And they were sending these... Uh, establishments letters saying we're going to sue you in court uh, however if you agree to settle now and send us four thousand dollars out of court settlement we'll drop everything and when these store owners went to their own attorneys and said hey what should we do the attorney said well you can defend yourself because you can probably get out of this but your legal fees will probably be you know six or seven thousand dollars because these can be complicated cases so it might be cheaper just to give these people their four or five thousand dollars. And that's what a lot of people were doing. One of the hotel and that's called settling a lawsuit for a uh, for its nuisance value, uh, the cost of defending it, even though you're, you're right and you would probably win. Uh, the happy ending, of course, is that I passed a new law which prevented that kind of vexatious, uh, predatory legal behavior. And I also my law also gives store owners time to correct the problem if they're notified and then have no action against them at all. Uh, so that's civil law. Let's look at administrative law. Administrative law consists of rules, regulations created by administrative agencies to regulate industry, business, and individuals. Administrative law includes uh, labor law, immigration law, uh, consumer law, uh, occupational safety law. Uh, there, there is a mountain of different areas of consumer law, all uh, administered by different administrative agencies at both the state and local level. So we create these agencies like the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, and they get to pass regulations for uh, work site safety uh, and if you break them, uh, you can be brought into their administrative hearing and, and possibly fined. So that's a different type of law. Um, so agencies that, that administer uh, administrative law 
besides OSHA, which I just mentioned, could be the Federal Communications Commission uh, as an example of the Department of Labor. Uh, from a police level, uh, we don't enforce too many administrative laws. When I was a police officer back in New York, uh, we did enforce taxi cab, yellow taxi cab violations. And those were administrative rules uh, created by an administrative agency called the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. And we would write hack complaints, which were like summonses for cabs violating uh, the administrative rules, like refusing to take some person somewhere or having a cab that was filthy or, or what have you. Uh, so while police generally don't enforce administrative law, we occasionally do. And if, if it's an administrative law that the officer does not enforce and a person comes to them, usually the officer will, will refer that person to the appropriate administrative agency that deals with it. Of course, violating some administrative laws can sometimes be a criminal act. Uh, in New York State, you had the Civil Rights Commission, and they had several civil rights violations that were not just fines, but were actually criminal acts. So that's administrative law. Case law, uh, which again uh, is also called precedent, is the accumulated written rulings of criminal, civil, and administrative courts that uh, require that previous court decisions in similar cases be considered as a guide to present action. So when higher level courts rule and interpret uh, laws with nebulous wording, uh, if they're higher level courts, all the courts below them are expected to abide by that ruling, and that's, uh, and that's called precedent. Uh, and the reason why we have uh, precedent in case law uh, is to provide consistency and stability to the law. So case law is based upon the legal principle of stare decisis, which is Latin for to stand by the decision. And it binds current courts to follow their prior decisions and the decisions of courts above them in deciding new cases with similar issues as the old cases. Most case, laws deal, case law deals with legal procedures and the interpretations of the law. And stare decisis makes the law consistent, which gives people, and also uh, reliable, which gives people fair warning of what they can and cannot do. And this is very important because uh, you wouldn't have much business activity and even people would be afraid of doing certain things if they thought that something which the courts previously said was perfectly all right or some interpretation uh, uh, was, was proper, uh, businesses and even people would be wary about even doing stuff like that in the future for fear that some other court judge would say, oh, I don't think so, this is different. So we have this precedent so that we have certain amount of stability and predictability. That might be the best word, predictability in the law. All right, let's talk about procedural law. Procedural law is the law that details the steps or the procedures to be used to handle those brought into the criminal justice system. For the police, uh, this involves the law of search and seizure. You know, when can you search somebody? When can you seize their property? When can you seize them, which is an arrest, right? It also involves the rules of evidence. Uh, these are mostly court rules, but it deals with uh, the biggest one being that if a police officer breaks the procedural laws in searching somebody or arresting somebody and therefore comes into contact with evidence that can be used against that person, because it was an illegal search or illegal arrest, the rules of evidence would prevent that evidence from being used in court. And in fact, it would also prevent evidence uh, that was found because of the illegally seized evidence. So if I searched you uh, after I illegally arrested you and I found uh, maybe a, a key to a locker uh, with a note that there were drugs in that locker and I went there, opened it and seized the drugs, uh, those drugs would not be admissible in court because I illegally arrested you, so I illegally seized the key and the note about the drugs. So those drugs are considered the fruits of the forbidden tree. The forbidden tree being the uh, illegal search and seizure. Uh, and arrest procedure is also an example of procedural criminal law. And this also extends into the, uh, the court processes and even the correctional processes. So that's the final uh, significant area of law that police deal with, 
procedural criminal law. So that's the end of lesson one, part three, and you can now go on to uh, lesson three, part two.